done great things. sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord.
your people have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. I alone am left, and now they seek to take my life. How long will you people waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If all, follow him. Anani Adonai Anani, Fiadu Ha'am Hazeh, Kiata Adonai Ha'Elohim. I will have my revenge, Elijah. By this time tomorrow, you'll be as dead as any one of those prophets. Why did you ever come here? A holy man barging in, exposing my sin and killing my son. Give me your son. Adonai Elohai Tashavna, Nefesh HaYelet Hazef, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450. Let them call on the name of their God. I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Good morning. I wonder if you'd pray with me now. Let's bow our heads. Father, in this hour, let it be known to everyone who is watching, everyone who is listening, that you are God. Strengthen us now, Lord, as we read your word, as we try to understand what you want us to do with our lives. Draw us together. Draw us to your son, Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. William Shakespeare said this. He said, be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great. Some achieve greatness. And others have greatness thrust upon them. In this popular, probably overly used quote, Shakespeare explains three ways people can experience greatness. He says some are born with greatness, meaning they're born into some high position. Maybe it's a powerful, influential, famous family. Others experience greatness by working hard. They reach a prestigious stature by the sweat of their brow. And still others experience greatness because they find themselves suddenly caught in a circumstance or situation. It's that moment when greatness passes right before them. These are gut-wrenching moments oftentimes when men, women, and even children have had to, great, uh, had to face great peril. Like that time that Captain Chelsea Sullenberger his airplane was experiencing a major malfunction and he had to land that plane, an emergency landing in the Hudson River. Or what about maybe that time when Pee Wee Reese walked over to his teammate and put his arm around Jackie Robinson? Or that time Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus? It's in these moments when greatness comes so close to us, passing right in front of us. And, it, and it's how people respond when greatness comes close that determines whether or not they become people of greatness. A decision is made that can become a defining moment in the life of any person. And as a result, greatness is thrust upon that person. It says, be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. And that's what I, we're looking at today as we turn in our Bibles once again and look at the crazy life of Elijah. He was that prophet, that man of God, who was that person who experienced God's greatness, and the greatness of God was thrust 
upon him. So let's open our Bibles today and pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to begin with verse 1 and then we're going to jump down to verse 17. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your family, or father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Wow, that sounds like a call out. I mean, that, that just reminds me of what would happen in my neighborhood growing up. Like, like maybe this happened in your neighborhood, but you'd have two kids and they'd be having a big fight, big powwow. And all of a sudden, a showdown happens. And one of those kids looks at the other one and says, you know what, let's settle this right now. You go get all your friends. I'll go get all mine. Things are fixing to get a bit cray-cray here. After three and a half years, this conflict is finally coming to a head. Remember, the Lord was against the king, King Ahab, and his people because they had started worshiping other gods. Instead of only worshiping Yahweh, the one true God, they started to mix in a little idolatry. As a result, brought, God brought a drought that would last three and a half years. The land and all of its inhabitants, including the people, the plants, the animals, they had all suffered through this. God said to Elijah, it's time to get on with this. Let's finish it with this showdown. The showdown was going to take place on Mount Carmel. You guys ready for a showdown? Anybody? How about you at home? Anybody? Showdown? Anybody? Yes? Amen. Well, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, considered to be one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, in one of his sermons, he talked about how there were three kinds of persons who showed up on Mount Carmel that day. Three kinds of people that showed up at this showdown. Let's see if you can recognize who they are. First, there was the lone devoted servant, the Elijah. He was the last of the Lord's prophets who was willing to stand up against King Ahab. Second, there were the servants of evil. You know, they were the prophets, the worshipers of Baal, including King Ahab himself. And third, there were the undecided. The undecided, they were the people that were unsure for they were the ones that had tried to worship both Yahweh and this idol God called Baal. You see, they gave half their heart to God and half their heart to an idol. And we read on in verse 20. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel, and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Even though they said nothing, their silence spoke volumes about their position. You see, they had forgotten what was written in Exodus 34, 14, that the Lord's name is jealous and that our God is a jealous God. You see, God was tired of putting up with this mistress. The greatness of God was coming close and Elijah tells the undecided, it's time to make your decision. When the greatness of God comes close, it's time to, number one, get off the fence. You know what I mean when I say that, get off the fence? When I'm not working at the church office or sometimes I work at home, one of my other favorite places to work is at the Panera Bread. 
Any, anyone will do. They're all pretty nice places. But is anybody else here like Panera? Okay, there's two people here. One, two, three, maybe a few more. Some of you are judging me now because I said I like Panera. It's okay. Well, you know, I, I could spend all day there and I can get a boatload of work done. I just take my laptop and I eat breakfast and the coffee. You just keep getting refills and you find a buddy there and you say, hey, will you watch my stuff while I go to the bathroom because you drink enough coffee and that's going to happen. And then when, I, when it gets to lunchtime, you just go back up and one of the things I love is the you pick two option. If you know anything about Panera, you know, you know they, they got great soup. My, my, one of my favorites is the cream of chicken wild rice soup. And, and I used to have this sandwich called the Cuban, and they stopped making it. So now I settle for the toasted Frontega chicken sandwich. It's just wonderful. Get in my belly, that's basically what I say. Um, and, and, and again, I, I just I love it there. Well, you know, when it comes to lunch, you may want to pick two, but when it comes to God, you can't pick two. You can't choose the you pick two option. Why? Because you can't serve two gods. You can't serve two gods because you can't have two masters. You see, the people who were undecided at Mount Carmel, they wanted the you pick two option. They were entertaining two ideas not realizing that Yahweh and Baal aren't guests to in, be entertained. They're actually gods and masters to be obeyed and served. For it is written, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. I wonder today, who else are we trying to worship besides God? Now, if you recall in week one, I, I referenced a, a pastor, uh, Pastor Timothy Keller. He's an author. He wrote the book, Counterfeit Gods. And um, he's got a great explanation or description of what an idol is. And these, again, are those, those counterfeit gods that we tend to worship. He says this. He says, idols are anything more important to you than God or anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. And I wonder today, what is competing for your attention? What is competing for your imagination, for your worship? What is competing with God? What has got you on the fence? It's time to stop serving the idols that we like to, to, to just draw our attention to, like the idol of wealth, success, fame, or anything else that has your attention. It's time to get off the fence. Amen? So Elijah challenges the people and the prophets of Baal. He requests that two bulls be chosen, one given to Elijah and one to the 450 prophets of Baal. Each side would slaughter and prepare one to be sacrificed. They'd place it on the pile of wood, but no fire would be set by human hands. Instead, both sides would call on their God to set fire to the sacrifice. And the God that answers by fire is the real God. This is the challenge of the showdown. And in verse 26, we read these words. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. All morning long, 450 people called to their God, but he was silent. Even all of their dancing and shouting couldn't rouse this God of theirs. The second point is this. When greatness comes close, it's time to recognize evil for what it really is. It's time to recognize evil for what it really is. Let's face it, evil promises 
many things, but it won't deliver on them. And even if it does deliver, it's only for the temporary. In the end, evil will leave you empty. It will leave you wanting more. Elijah knows this, and he starts to get a little cocky, because remember, their God isn't responding to anything. And this is what he says in verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Let's just say Elijah's had enough. All morning long, he's been watching and listening, these prophets. He says, what's wrong? I don't see your God answering you. Maybe you should shout louder. Maybe he's musing or maybe he's busy. The Hebrew word translated here as busy is actually tied to the act of relieving waste from the body. So Elijah is basically saying this, perhaps your God is in the bathroom relieving himself. You never thought you'd see that in the Bible, would you? I mean, he's really getting cocky here. He's really saying your God is nothing. As you can expect, the sarcasm riles them up further. They start shouting even louder until what follows is really a sad thing. The text says that they start self-mutilating, which was customary in their worship. They start slashing themselves with swords and spears. And it must have been quite a sight as the blood began to flow. As evil began to show itself for what it really was, destructive. Despite all of this activity, all of this enthusiasm, there was still no response, no answer from a deity. No God paid a lick of attention to what they were doing. I want to tell you today, this is the truth. This is what I believe. There is no other God but Yahweh, the one true God. Every other God that, that has been invented by man like Baal and Asherah and, and any other god, is fictional. And if these gods are not real, then who or what is at the center of this? Who's behind all of this? And it's none other than the enemy, Satan himself. Now, Satan is really powerful. There's no doubt about that. But let's remember, Satan is not a god. He himself is limited. And he is inferior to God. In the end, Satan and all of his evil deeds will reveal his limitations as well as his intent. Recognize evil for what it truly is. It's destructive, it's empty, it's impotent, and not able to deliver on its promises. In verse 30, <clears throat> Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Even when the evil one tries to silence us, we can still speak the truth. Number three, when greatness comes close, it's time to get ready for God to show up. Let's get ready for God to show up. What do you say? Getting ready for God requires that we make some preparations, and that's exactly what the people did with Elijah. Let's take a look and see what they did to prepare for the greatness of God that was coming. First off, Elijah says, come close. You got to be able to see what I'm doing. Get close. Secondly, Elijah shows the people here this abandoned altar. Now this abandoned altar had, had somehow been discarded. It had been abandoned to the point where they forgot about it. It was in ruins. It's a symbol. Think about it this way. It's a symbol of the way that they had abandoned their worship of God. He shows them, Elijah shows them, 
that they can rebuild and reestablish what was thrown away. They can turn to the God of their ancestors at any time, and he will show up. I can't help but be reminded in the New Testament when, when if we look at Revelation, um, where the churches are written to, um, the Apostle John writes Revelation, and he's instructed by Jesus to write these messages to the churches. And to the church in Ephesus, we find these words. John writes, again, these are the words of Jesus John's writing down. He says, I have this one thing against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. They had forgotten their first love, and who was it? It was Jesus. Elijah's invitation to come close and rebuild this abandoned altar echoed Jesus' words in Revelation. Ask yourself the question today, have I forsaken my first love? Have I gotten so busy with life? Have I started going through the actions of being a Christian? You know, maybe reading the Bible and praying and, and, and trying to actively do that relationship, serving at church. Have I missed the point of it? Has it just become a checkbox? I did it all today. I'm good. Have I forsaken my first love? And if you have, repent. That means turn around, to go back and do the things you did. Start loving him again. Well, after Elijah rebuilds the altar, Elijah gives instructions that would be gathered and placed on the altar. Then the bull is brought and prepared. The last preparation made is that a trench is dug around the perimeter. Elijah gives instructions for water to be brought and poured on the sacrifice and the wood, and not just once, but three times, until it was completely and utterly saturated, and this trench that they had dug was full of water. Now, why would you intentionally drench wood and everything else that you're trying to set fire to? Well, most people would know that that that'd really make it harder to burn it. But Elijah wanted to make sure absolutely sure that when the greatness of God showed up, that it would be undeniably God's doing. Like there's no way that this could be some sort of trick. There's no smoke, there's no mirrors here. And in verse 36, we read these words. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That's quite a prayer. When the greatness of God comes close, it's time to earnestly pray with potency. We've got to earnestly pray with potency. The prayer of Elijah is different than the ordinary prayer. It's more than a petition, for there's a stated purpose in it that goes beyond the person praying. Elijah asked God to do this so that people will know that Yahweh is God. And that it's Yahweh that's turning the people's hearts back to him. Now here's a few things to notice. The prayer isn't for the sake of success. He doesn't say, Lord, do this so that I'm not a liar. Lord, do this so I'm not embarrassed. It's also not for selfish motive. He doesn't say, Lord, get me out of here. I don't want to die. The purpose of his prayer is intended for those who are undecided, for those who need to put their faith back into God and worship Him alone. I wonder what would happen if we started praying like Elijah did. 
Like if we started praying with that kind of potency in our prayers, and if it, we were earnest about it, when you pray, what do you pray for? Who do you pray for? Are your prayers only for yourself, for your family? Do you only pray for those you know that are sick and hurting, or do you pray for those that are lost, those who are undecided? When Elijah prayed his prayer, this was the result. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The greatness of God passed right in front of the people. Suddenly, those who were unsure became very convicted. And they got down on their faces, bent down on the ground, and they confess that there's only one Lord, and his name is Yahweh. This was their defining moment, the very moment when greatness passed right before them. And they stood there as witnesses. I wonder this morning, what's it going to take for you to encounter the greatness of God today? What will be your defining moment? How will you respond in your defining moment? And after you respond, will you respond not only with putting your faith in Jesus Christ, but by also committing your life to helping others have their defining moment? I wonder today if other people could look at your life and say, that person's crazy. Look at the amount of faith that they have. I want to be like that person too. I'm not naive to think today that some of us here, some of us watching online, have had other defining moments in our life that we regret. We have all kinds of stuff in our past, maybe something we're going through right now in the present. It's defined us, and we're not okay with that. I want to tell you today, there is someone who can redeem you, and he was the greatness of God that came to earth. And he says to all of us, come to me. You can come back to me. And we can worship him. And we can serve him alone. Let's do that today. And I promise you that the greatness of God will be thrust upon you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today, Lord, we're in your presence. And we're in awe of the things that you've done in the past, the things that you're doing in the present, and the things that you've promised to do in the future. Lord, we also just confess to you that we're so unworthy of, of, of all of these things. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for how you see us through another day. Lord, we're calling on you today most of all to save us and to save those who are lost, who are undecided. Lord, help us as we reveal to others the greatness of God. Bind Satan today and speak truth into our minds and our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to, to sing and respond. This is the time when you can pray and you can make some decisions. If you've been postponing making a decision to follow Christ fully, this is your opportunity. Don't let the, the, the greatness of God pass before you. Respond. Cry out to him today. You can call the number on the screen if you're watching online, or you can meet me in the prayer room and, and we can pray and talk. Uh, if you'd like to be baptized today, we can make that happen. But let us, let us know. Let's stand.
Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, that you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe through every blessing. And Peter wrote, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. He is the one. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now, in these last days, he, is not, he has been revealed for your sake. 
Today, this is the joy that we have in knowing Christ. And today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. You have in your seats here some bread and some juice. And you'll just tear those off and take those on your own today as, as the Lord leads you. I want to pray and then we'll do that. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for the sacrifice, for sending Jesus to pay our ransom. Help us now, Lord, as we remember his sacrifice, that it would be remembered and change us in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. just want to share a few announcements with you before we depart. Number one, thank you for your generosity. Each week, uh, your giving uh, sustains our ministries here locally and globally. And uh, we just want to thank you for that. Encourage you to continue to give. Uh, we promise to, to be good stewards of your financial gifts. We're also extremely excited that tonight, Connect is going to start. It's at 6 p.m. and it's our, our senior high youth ministry. Uh, it's in the building just across the parking lot. So uh, teenagers, high school students, if you're planning to come, uh, don't forget to invite a friend tonight and uh, join Pastor Brian out there uh, 6 p.m. We want to encourage you today as, as we finish, as I pray at the end, that you'll stay seated until an usher dismisses you uh, we appreciate you understanding as we try to practice that social distancing. We also have some donations that uh, are, are needed right now, and, and uh, some of the needs uh, are, are non-perishable food items, plastic bags, as well as some volunteering that needs done. So uh, see the ad there on the screen about that information, and you can seek out more information about that. And We just thank you for, for doing that and, and serving each week. Um, today, uh, it's been a joy to be with you, and we just encourage you to, to go out and uh, live like people that have encountered the greatness of God. Follow Jesus today. Let's pray. Father, help us now as we exit this room and as we turn off our electronic devices, remind us that your glory has changed us and that we're to live differently. Lord, every conversation that we have, um, every every where we go. Help us to be salt and light today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week.